So I'm supposed to tell you about reservoir computing. Um, so I will combine this a little bit with, um, let's say, basics and how to, let's say, implement the concept in hardware systems and what to do with those. So that you basically go from data injection, then what you do with the data in order to do the learning or the training until you get your last results. And I will basically combine this a little bit with um, a tour through the things which we and other people in the field have done in the last, let's say, eight years more or less. Good. So the first, I think this is just a slide I always put in these things because there's always a bit of confusion in my point of view. Uh, why do we actually need neural networks? And uh, for me, the question there always is, um, of course, nobody gets the idea to do you know, multiplication or division or anything of this type of computation with a neural network, but what do you actually need it for? And for me there, the buzzword is not really artificial intelligence or anything like this. It's, um, let's say, ooh, okay, <laughs> different version of the slide. <laughs> um, it's, uh, let's say, non-algorithmic. So basically, as soon as you face a problem where you do not find a clear set of instructions, Let's say um, you want to simulate a physical system. Typically, you do this by creating a model. You know how to do that, and you know how, uh, how to implement this in MATLAB, Python, or whatever um, simulation tool or language. So for neural networks, really, the application, in my point of view, uh, of view, is you face a problem where you do not really know how to solve it. So in this case, what makes a cat a cat or a dog a dog, or where in this picture is um, Einstein or Marie Curie? So basically, instead of finding a, a very complicated, you know, abstract way of treating these problems, you just uh, give the task to these networks where you just create a bunch of different transformations and then just by optimization you somehow get to the, to the problem. So in the end it's a little bit like advanced fitting to a, a complex input-output relationship. But then, of course, um, um, it's really difficult to grasp these systems because in the end you always, let's say from a fundamental point of view, they are very simple. If you look at the atomistic um, unit, you have a simple nonlinear node, you have some connections. Um, if you do a model, you actually even have all the parameters, yet you still do not understand this. And um, this really creates a whole bunch of problems when you want to apply it to problems. For example, um, here we have um, a very simple formula which creates us the Mackey glass sequence. And um, if we want to implement this in a computer, it's, um, let's say, very efficient and very easy to simulate this kind of um, equation. And then only after 100 milliseconds, actually a MATLAB script, which is not optimized at all, which is just doing what I tell it to, I don't use any tricks, basically is able to compute me a couple of hundred thousand data points. But if I want to reverse this, actually to go from here to here, I have, first of all, no real idea how to solve that problem. I have to find more, let's say, abstract um, solutions. And at the same time, this basically will take me about 100 times the, the computational, um, um, well, the, the, the computation will take about 100 times the duration. So this is basically, for me, a little bit the implementation of, or the illustration of what we need these devices for to go from a system where we might even understand everything, but then if we want to go to a solution which is more abstract, so for example here, how do we predict this kind of system, then we need something of neural networks where instead of giving the computer a certain type of instructions, we really just reduce the problem to learning. So this was like a, in two slides a motivation why and for what um, these systems could be used for. And, so a reservoir is, in the end, um, nothing else than a complex dynamical system. If you look at um, the, the, the concept from a nonlinear dynamics point of view, um, it consists in the center of a reservoir. Um, and the reservoir there is just, let's say, a collection of nonlinear nodes, which are connected in the, in the original con uh, context random um, fashion. But in the end, uh, what basically the entire field has been using when you want to transfer this into hardware is not really using random connection, but let's say non-trivial connection, um, complex connectivity. But it's typically true randomness is difficult to implement. So, and then as an operational state, the most um, typical operation condition is that you just go to, um, let's say, close to criticality when you want to use the words um, of the first presentation yesterday. So that means um, you do not 
um, control or modify individual local nodes. You just define a connectivity, but what is required is that you ba can basically scale the overall weight of this connectivity. Because if you would go too strong in these um, um, connections, then basically you would induce autonomous dynamics in the system. The system would destabilize. And then if you inject information repeatedly, and it's the same information, your answer will always be different. And of course, with this, you cannot efficiently learn. Then, of course, we have the connection to the input data. And this is equally done by some, in the original concept, random matrices. Um, and this, in the implementation hardware, is a little bit easier to do random than the final connection of the recurrent network. And in the end, you have um, a linear readout layer. And this is basically the only part of the entire system which participates in the optimization or in the training step. So the first layer is just linear connections, which you also scale um, in their overall amplitude, but you do not modify them locally. The same is true for the, for the, for the recurrent uh, network. And um, training in the end is reduced to only optimizing these individual connection weights. And this for um, an implementation in hardware, of course, um, is almost a dream come true because it's quite easy to implement, let's say, non-trivial connections. It's not easy to manipulate them on an individual basis, but let's say you can scale them globally. Um, it's a very big help for, let's say, building the hardware system. Because in the end, this, for example, could even be approximated by a spatially continuous system. So one of the first demonstrations of, you can debate if this was reservoir computing, but of this, computing concept idea was actually just using a bucket of water and um, perturbing it and to produce surface ripples. And for me, this is a really nice um, illustration what you can actually use for computing, but uh, the performance of this device was actually below the linear limit, so you cannot really claim it's a good computer, but it really illustrates how, how flexible this concept is, and this is what really makes it attractive to hardware. Um, but at the same time, at the end, I want to finish with a word of warning in, with, um, in respect to exactly this property. Sorry, just a yes. short question. Why do you say that your output <coughs> requires linear weights? The, this is the concept. You do not really need to use linear weights. If you use linear weights here, training can basically be done by solving an analytical matri matrix equation. If the weights are not linear, you cannot do this matrix inversion. But let's say if you use, and I will show this later on, basically if you use a different learning mechanism to, to, to obtain these weights, then you can also use nonlinear connections. So the original concept is linear because it used the matrix inversion to train these weights. But if you use a, a hardware system and you find a way how to implement nonlinear weights, then you will just have to use a different training routine. Okay, one consequence of the random connectivity inside your network is that actually what you find is connection loops. So, for example, um, the signal of this node can basically propagate from this node to this node and come back after some time steps to this. So this basically means that if you inject new information into your system, actually the system still has information about previous states. And this is this um, so-called echo state property. And with this, basically, you mix information of different time steps, and therefore you can actually solve um, computational problems which have a temporal context. And in this um, aspect, it's different from, let's say, most deep neural network and feed-forward neural network. They do not have a temporal context in the state um, variable. And therefore, if you want to do things like signal prediction or um, language models where you try to obtain um, the context not only of a word but of a sequence of words, then you will typically use some recurrent structure like this, not necessarily reservoir computing. Okay, so how do you operate such a reservoir? Of course, you need your input information, then you have your network state, which is then some nonlinearity, and then here we have some um, connectivity matrix. This is the internal connectivity matrix to the previous network state. This is the connectivity matrix to the input of the external information. And as I said before in the original concept, both, uh, both of those were chosen randomly, but in the end you can use a physical process which is not, um, or which is complex or non-trivial, and then actually they also work pretty well as reservoir, compu uh, reservoir computers already, and here you just has, have a bias term which can 
be whatever parameter in the end. And here this is how you obtain the output. You basically just multiply your state variable via these readout um, weights. So how do you configure this system? If you do a model, you just reinitialize matrices omegas um, um, randomly. Then you typically rescale the um, matrix omega by its largest eigenvalue. So you basically can go close to the, um, to the, the critical point before you start to produce um, autonomous dynamics in the system. And then for omega injection, there is multiple strategies. But in the end, you also have rather big degree of freedom. And in the end, if you have a physical system, these are typically defined by your input and by your system properties. So what you then need is um, a set of training data of uh, inputs of u of n. They can then be, let's say, a time series you want to predict, or they can be spoken, um, spoken digits or you know, um, something typically with a temporal context. So you can also do object recognition like in the MNIST data set, but then the question is why, why do you need memory? So um, it depends. Okay, so basically you have your set of inputs for which you have the label or the intended in, um, output of the system, U of N. Then you take all of these inputs, you just inject them into your system and you, connect, uh, you collect for all the states, for all, uh, you collect the system states for all input data. And with this you basically just collect a gigantic um, matrix where you have a vector for each instance of your uh, input data, and then in the other dimension you basically have your, in this case it's time, but you basically just have the number of um, example data sets you have. And then what is typically done is something where you, which is called cross-validation. You say, okay, I now divide the input data set into some fraction, let's say five. So you assign labels one to five, for example, randomly, or to different continuous sections of your input data to your examples, and then selecting um, one of these labels, you say, okay, now I use um, cross-validation label one. Then you take all example data with labels two, three, four, five. Um, from those, you create your state collect matrix, which is just concatenating the reservoir response for all of these examples, which do not include the, 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 the test label which you have chosen. You do exactly the same for your target outputs. And then basically you just can create a matrix relationship where you have the state collect matrix times the readout matrix gives you the um, collect matrix of your answers. And you can do this with linear regression or you can do it a little bit better here by rich regression where you have some parameters which try to avoid overfitting. But in the end, um, it's rather easy matrix equations. So in this trick, exactly, you cannot do if you have um, nonlinear readout weights because it doesn't become a linear matrix operation then. And then you just um, obtain um, the set of readout weights using this type of example data. You take the example input and output or the example reservoir state and example output for the label you've chosen and which was not part of this training step. And you just obtain the output uh, y of n for this label and with this you compute the test error. So compared to other um, neural network schemes it's um, rather simple because you just collect all the data of your reservoir state for all the um, input and output data examples you have and then you just use different, yes? What is lambda? Lambda is basically a factor which tries to avoid overfitting um, this matrix. So it's typically small, somewhere 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3. Um, if you have a system with noise, so any experimental implementation of this concept in some hardware, um, you basically um, can ignore this most of the time. So this is important when you create a model on your computer, because otherwise you get um, overfitting if you put this to zero. If you use an experimental system, you do not really have to worry about this. Okay, so the um, take home message for this is if you want to do this in hardware, it's almost too nice to be true, is don't worry about the system. It should be nonlinear and you should be able to control the overall um, internal connection strength so that it doesn't destabilize. But then basically from this, um, you can just go ahead, inject data, record the data and try how good is it for computing. <coughs> 
Yes? Maybe I missed it. You added to me. You end up the algorithm in five, which is the measure the error. Yes. Did I miss how you now adapt the weight? <coughs> the weight adaption is this matrix, uh, matrix equation here. So, so it's not an iterative adaption. It is because you have basically a matrix equation of your state collect matrix times the matrix omega out equals your matrix of example um, outputs. So you can just invert the matrix and you directly get the set of, of weights. Yes, so all you need if you want to do this in hardware is you basically need to have good control over the um, distance to the first bifurcation, to the first destabilization of the system, and that you can, let's say, easily measure the state of the system. If you do not have access to the state of the system, obviously it's a little bit tricky to, to, uh, to train it. What do you mean by state of the system? What is exactly, which, which information do you need for that? You need the state of this network. But you don't need all the information on every way. No, you need the state, yes. not, not the topology. And in the end, you can define whatever you want as the state. Let's say you use a, a big laser system. You can either use the frequency, intensity, you know. It's basically up to your choosing, I would say. OK, the other question is, why would you implement this um, networks in hardware? In the end, um, everybody has a desktop PC where you can nicely simulate these systems and um, you know train them and it's all very comfortable so why do you want to integrate this in hardware and what this always takes me back to is like the most fundamental um, observations about a brain if it's a human brain or um, an animal brain or a million brain it doesn't really matter and there are some fundamental properties where um, in the end this inspiration of neural networks of any kind is coming from means they are fully parallel, they are very high dimensional, and they are all um, hardware connected. So this is something where this system is fundamentally different than any uh, computation and um, simulation machine we have right now. If you want to create uh, communication between different parts of your processor, you use serial communication protocols. So by this you slow down the process, you waste a lot of energy. If you look at these very simple neuron cells, simple not in their structure but let's say in their functionality what you just see is that they are insanely complex in terms of how many nodes they are connected to how many neighbors they are connected to and in this it's basically um, a fundamentally different architecture of the underlying let's say computing substrate compared to um, to what we are using today so if you just use a single core cpu in the end you have this uh, reservoir state equation but because you cannot fully um, um, execute this, this, this matrix equation in parallel, you basically just have to do n squared loops where every mate ent uh, rate matrix entry is updated in a serial fashion and then you all um, condense it to one state again. If you have a more efficient architecture like a GPU, of course you can go much, uh, much more efficient. But um, I don't know how many of you are aware of um, something called the TPU. It's the tensor uh, processing unit, which was designed by Google the first version like four years ago, I think five years ago, where they basically went and said, OK, what we want is um, a special purpose chip, which is only focused on doing efficiently a matrix product. And this is basically what is now the backbone of all machine learning in um, Google servers, uh, service centers. But if you look at the global system rate, and um, there is a nice review paper from Google on archive, you found out that actually even this system only operates at the frame rate of 200 kilohertz. So if you consider how, how fast this technology is actually and how fast you could push um, a fully parallel um, electronic hardware system, this is still close to six orders of magnitude away what you could get if you fully operate such a system in parallel. So this for me is more or less the most powerful il illustration why it's really worth to, to you know, spend a lot of time and find hardware substrates. But then at the same time, you always have to keep in mind that actually you're trying to solve a problem and not just take something because it's a system you like and um, promise something crazy about the system you like and um, implement uh, the scheme. So um, there is some fundamental considerations, I think, which are really becoming important if you, if you want to implement such a system. Okay, so fundamentally, 
or from a, from a fundamental point of view, what I've um, introduced right now is um, the classical reservoir, and this is a spatially, let's say, multiplex system. So you have a lot of number of, in this case, discrete nodes, and in this illustration, they are located at different positions in space. Um, this means injection rates are constant in, in time, and the, let's say, data rate of the system is really the bandwidth of the nodes. So if you could implement such a system one-to-one -one in hardware, then this device would actually spit out information at the bandwidth of the individual nodes if you would ignore the propagation delay. Um, the problem is, as you can see, this will include uh, controlling the state or let's say at least uh, um, the properties of hundreds or even thousands of nonlinear nodes and the same for their connections. So the first implementation is um, pretty tricky or can be pretty tricky. Um, this is why, let's say, by now, well, seven years already, um, people started to map this kind of architecture on something which, from an experimental point of view, is much more simple. You take a single nonlinear node and you couple it uh, to delay. And this, in the end, and this is basically what I will show in the next few slides, corresponds to a network of ring oscillators. The problem is now the system, again, almost like in a serial processor, is multiplexed in time. So you need to wait the delay um, to uh, the delay time until you have one full uh, update of your system state. The big thing you gain here is that you do not really need to take care anymore of computing the connectivity matrix. So let's say you already go from the scaling problem of n squared to only a slowdown by a factor of n if you increase the system size. Um, is this different than the Pentotron idea that came out in like 2008 where they also do time delay? Pentotron? Yeah. No idea. <laughs> um, don't know it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is basically, um, this in my point of view was a little bit the breakthrough or the, 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 re-ignition re of interest in this field again because this from a hardware point of view is really simple to implement. So a delay system, just to make it very quick, you can have some kind of um, delay differential equation here where you have the update of your system state and here is the nonlinear function of your system with some feedback term s and s is time normalized to the delay time. And then typically, if this is a low-pass system, you just have a system response time, and this here also is normalized to the delay time. If you do not um, couple this um, system to feedback, and the, uh, beta here is the feedback coupling factor, and tau is the delay of the feedback, then you can, let's say, drive it with a single delta pulse, and what you get is this blue, you know, typical decay, like almost in an uh, overdamped um, oscillator. If you drive the system um, with this brown data um, binary sequence, that what you get is actually a more complex um, uh, signal. And what is important here is that we drive the system faster than its response time is. So you never get to the steady state. And this is important and what we uh, will follow in the discussion. If you, have now in if you now include beta, so you uh, include the cell feedback, Actually, what you get to is uh, a situation typically like this. Um, on the x-axis, you see beta, and at some critical parameter, suddenly your system destabilizes and you get a bifurcation. And then you get into the autonomous dynamical state, and for reservoir computing, you typically try to sit very close to this point. This also always depends on the task you want to solve. So delay systems are highly simplistic. It's one nonlinear node. You just have to couple it to a linear delay term, and then basically you're finished. You only need to couple it also to, um, to, to, of course, the external information injection. But uh, why can you see them actually as a, as a network of ring oscillators? If you just look at the autonomous output of a delay system, once you've gone beyond the first bifurcation or basically you create autonomous dynamics, typically what you get is a time trace like this. You can maybe already you know, assume there is some structure in there. But if you then start chopping up this time trace in sequences with time delay um, of, uh, of one, and you stack them on top of each other, then you actually start to um, uh, highlight uh, some kind of pseudo or virtual space temporal structure where you have uh, 
this uh, delay window space on this axis and um, integer iterations of this step stacked along this direction. So here you, you can already infer a little bit that there is coupling in the network because in the end causality always drives the system that the perturbation, which is coming back after one delay time tau, basically induces the next state. And this you can rather um, neatly illustrate just by going back to Green's function approach. So you think just of um, first year or second year physics, you solve uh, um, a system's response just by knowing its impulse response function and then you basically convolute it with the driving signal. In this case, the driving signal is your delayed signal. So it's uh, the signal after one time delay, um, after one time delay here, so minus one. And then you just do the convolution integral where h is the impulse response function of your system. From there you just do some kind of re temporal reorganization instead of xs where s is uh, time normalized to the delay. You basically get two, um, to one integer n which is like integer time um, um, in the normal system. So this is integer numbers of delays. And the fractional number of delays in S is basically your subscript um, sigma here, and that is the node position along this delay line. And then you can do a little bit of reorganization, and then you just can see that basically the, the, the integral from infinity here, you can approximate just to going from my current point to one delay time before. The contribution to this uh, convolution integral which originates from further away is basically zero because your impulse response function typically decays much faster than the delay length. And with this you can basically just um, 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 transform this kind of delay differential equation into this integral and then what you, hear, uh, what you uh, see here just is that you have the coupling to the state one delay before and the coupling constant is given by the convolution of the impulse response function with the nonlinear system uh, with the system's nonlinearity. And all you need to do then is you can say, okay, due to the Shannon sampling theorem, you just go twice as fast in sampling as the system's fastest response time, and then you transform your continuous time sequence in a discrete um, chain of, um, of, of values. And here you have the, the separation of state and um, the coupling uh, due to the convolution of the nonlinear function. Yes. I'm a little bit confused. Usually, this convolution approach is a useful linear system and it's uh, explicitly written in the old textbook for nonlinear system. This approach does not work. How, how you can you do it for a nonlinear system? For nonlinear system, this um, in signal theory, this is used all the time. The, they, they just call it the impulse response function product. I don't know. It's, 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 it's normally used. <laughs> Convolution. Okay. Yeah. Push it, push it on. Mm. Okay. So then how to translate this delay system into um, a computer. Here you have your input sequence here. It's a scalar. So you have different uh, values of your input sequence. You discretize this for one duration of the delay interval. And then you multiply it with something which is the temporal mask, which in the end um, establishes the complex connectivity to your input. So this temporal mask in this case is a random um, Boolean or binary sequence and it's repeated every delay interval. And you multiply this just by the input value and then what you get is the input information which will look like this. This you just serially inject in your system and by its internal dynamics the system will basically create its response. And then, of course, if you want to connect it to the output, you need to demultiplex in time. So you again chop this um, response of your system up into sequences of delay length tau typically. And then you just find the temporal location of the individual nodes, multiply them with your weights, and what you get out is basically output, um, your output signal. Okay? So doing this with delay systems is uh, therefore rather easy in theory. The problem is it contains temporal modulation of weights at the input and at the output. And if you want to do this in real time, it actually directly becomes much more tricky. So what um, everybody or 98% of all publications in the field for now have done is uh, 
This signal is created offline on your desktop computer. You could put it on a USB key, you transfer it to your waveform generator, and you do the same, vice versa. You record the system's response, you copy it on the USB, you put it on your desktop, and then you um, do the reorganization of the temporal structure and multiply the weights. Um, there's only very few papers where all of these steps actually have been um, executed in real time, and this is basically by using an FPGA to control the delay system. But then again, the question arises, why do you build a computer if you need a bigger and more energy-consuming computer to control that computer? So, but I think the message here is, while, let's say, doing proof-of-principle experiments with this delay systems is very, very easy, and that makes them very, very attractive, if you really want to claim you built a computer, you have to go further. And especially, I think it's potentially not the best choice to implement a final reservoir computer to, to rely on this because what you gain in hardware simplicity, you, you pay for basically in data post, uh, pre and post processing. But in the end, what this um, led to was that starting from 2011, uh, people realize that all you need is a nonlinear node. You need some delay attached to it, and then um, you have your reservoir. And this very quickly went from electronics to optoelectronics to all optical systems, and then um, more more exotic systems were springing up. For example, here the spin torque, which was um, done in Julie's group. By now, you can really find a whole slew of different substrates uh, which have been used to, for this or which are basically suggested to be used for this in numerical modeling. So this really, really got people excited. Um, and by now, there's really an entire slew of these different systems. Um, and recently, we have written um, one review for photonic implementations of this. And in a special issue of uh, Journal of Applied Physics, we will have a tutorial on the delay um, uh, photonic reservoir computing. Okay, so this was basically the state-of-the-art concept to implement um, reservoirs and these computers. Um, but now, more and more, um, the focus, I think, starts shifting to not single delay um, oscillators, but really trying to build more, more high-dimensional, more complex systems where really there is many nodes and there are the connections implemented in hardware as in the previous, um, as in the original concept. And for me, basically, um, the motivation why I want to do this in optics or photonics, in the end, is hasn't really changed a lot since the 80s, where optical computing was already pretty big once before. Um, there people did the Hopfield network implementation by Dimitri Psaltis, and uh, the really fascinating thing I find there is that they did this only one or two years after the original paper was published. So they really picked up on this idea in a very short amount of time and then there followed a sequence of eight years where there was really amazing work done in this field and then it almost disappeared. And I think there's also a lesson for all of us in there a little bit in this, in this story. <laughs> um, what is the lesson? Um, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I think the lesson is that um, it's not enough to, uh, to have found a really elegant and beautiful system. That you, you really need to, uh, to show that you can get to where you are promising. You, know, you really need to be able to build a system and in the end be more energy efficient or faster or anything of this kind. Um, and what is the fundamental property of this one is it's spatially extended and that's because they try to uh, maximally um, take profit of um, the parallelism you find in optics. The same is true for, for, for uh, digital optical computing, which was done also um, 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 by, let's say, initially by a European community, which finally started um, or was also centered around um, Harriet Watt University in Scotland, where I, where I was before. So for me, why really um, optics is interesting to work on this is because, as I said before, optics is parallel. In my point of view, also, a 2D substrate is not completely efficient to implement neural networks. Um, and um, there, if someone is interested, we could discuss a bit later. Um, for optics, what is really interesting is you do not have a real trade-off um, when you increase the distance. Okay, you get more attenuation, let's say a couple of dB for centimeters um, when you have waveguides. But if you're in electronics, you have a fundamental connection between 
bandwidth of a signal, um, a signal transmitting line and, um, and its, its length. And in optics you can get around this. The other thing is in optics you do not have induction. You have crosstalk, that's true, um, but you do not have induction. So there are a, f a few differences with, I think, at least for the communication, make um, photonics or optics really well suited for neural networks. How many of those hold, um, we have to see once we've implemented such a device. Okay, so the first, um, or the experiment I want to show you for, for implementing such a large-scale spatial temporal system, we use a rather off-the-bench um, device, which is a spatial light modulator. I don't know how many people know it. It's basically, you could almost say it's a computer monitor, but instead <coughs> of having colors, it um, has in a certain, if you operate it in polarization filtering mode, it has polarization as, as a parameter you tune. If you then filter the polarization and you detect it, then you get this sine squared nonlinearity. And this, in the end, is very comparable to the delay systems which were implemented at the beginning, which had a Mach 10 modulator, which in the end produces exactly the same type of nonlinearity. So that means here we have a 2D substrate with potentially thousands of nonlinear neurons. The question is, how do we couple them? And here we take also a approach which, uh, which was a little bit inspired by the work which was done by Psaltis and the other people in the 80s. This here is a diffractive optical element, which you can say it's nothing else than a diffraction grating. Um, and we take the optical beam of each individual pixel and we basically propagate it twice through the DOE. At each transmission through the diffractive optical elements, what you get is you get a copy of the transmitted beam at discrete angle distributions. It's just a normal diffraction effect as you will learn it in you know, fundamental physics courses. If you combine this with imaging, here's the image of a single mode laser emitter uh, on a camera without anything in between, so no surprise, a single mode Gaussian. If you image it twice through this defective optic element, what you get is actually this set of discrete, spatially distributed copies of your original emitter. And if you then align certain parameters in your experiment, you can actually adjust or make this distance between the defective orders and the distances, uh, distances between your discrete elements on the 2D array identical. And if you would then reflect back that signal on your substrate, what you create is this kind of local coupling. And it's rather high dimensional. It's not really uniform for any of the elements inside of the, the array. So the experiment which we have come up with is here you have an illuminating laser, which is just being collimated. And then with the lens focused on the back focal plane of this lens, here's a polarizing beam splitter. And since we focus the illuminating laser on the back focal plane of this lens, what you get in front of the lens is a collimated beam or a plane wave. So you can use it to illuminate the surface um, of the spatial light modulator. So this basically creates our network state. Then we image, or then we let this reflection from that beam splitter, uh, from that spatial light modulator, propagate through a polarizing beam splitter. So we get the polarization filtering, which then produces basically the sine squared nonlinearity combined with the polarization rotation of the pixels, of the individual pixels in the SLM. Here we have our diffractive optical element and here's something which is called a quarter wave plate. All you need to know is that if you go twice through a quarter wave plate, you rotate your polarization 90 degrees. And that means we um, basically here create the coupling by spatially multiplexing twice. Here we now rotate the polarization again 90 degrees and therefore it's reflected out of this horizontal plane and imaged on the camera here by a final lens. So the polarizing beam splitter doesn't really throw away with the other polarization, but it just filters it. One, um, uh, the, I always forget if it's a P or the S polarization which is transmitted. I think it's S, it doesn't matter. One, uh, one polarization axis is transmitted, the other one is reflected. Since um, a cosine squared plus sine squared is one, the, content, uh, the information content in both directions is exactly the same. So we take this part of the system, which is coupled out, we image it on something which is called a, a digital micromirror array. And for those who don't know this, it's basically what you're all looking at inside the projectors. Um, the pixels of a, of a projector are just tiny mirrors which flip very quickly in one or the other direction. And we use this by creating an image of the reservoir state, so of the network state, onto the digital micromirror array. And um, along one angle from this uh, digital micromirror array, we place a detector. <coughs> 
And now basically by flipping mirrors into one direction or the other one, what we have implemented is basically Boolean weights. And we can say the mirror flipping in this direction, the particular pixel will contribute to our computational result. If it's flipped in the other direction, it will not. So this is the way how we implement the readout matrix. And then what we have to do so far still with MATLAB is we read the camera state. And uh, basically the image on the camera is this um, absolute square and inside you have the sum where we approximate the operation by the defective optical element just by coupling matrix. And then here the electric field coming from the, from the spatial light modulator. And for now information injection also um, is still done in MATLAB, but um, we have ideas or we are working on right now to implement this also optically. And then here is some phase offset term uh, theta. This product we send back to the SLM and then basically via the polarization filtering we get the sine squared nonlinearity. So from a structural point of view it's very, not, all, not identical, but it's very similar to the rest of our state equation. Okay. So, but as you pointed out before, um, this um, state matrix here is basically squared of the field. So here we face exactly the problem what we discussed uh, before. It's not a linear matrix equation anymore. So we cannot just operate and uh, record the state matrix and then just invert it. We really need to come up with a different uh, kind of training um, routine. And this will follow, um, follow soon. And this also should be updated, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, this is the coupling matrix what we've implemented. So basically here you see the diagonal lines which in the end is just um, um, coming from the rearranging the, the 2D image on the camera and just concatenating the different columns below each other for one pixel being illuminated. And then if you zoom in you can basically see that you have this local um, substantial local diversity and homogeneity and this basically is then the high dimensional coupling. Okay, I have to speed up a bit. Um, here you see the impact um, the coupling actually induces onto the network state. Here you see a bifurcation diagram of a particular pixel just when you couple the pixel to its own feedback term. Um, it's the classical um, period doubling route to chaos. If you introduce the coupling, the entire bifurcation um, um, character of the network state changes. So we have a very strong modification of the network dynamic going from individual lattices to, to really a coupled network. So now for training what we do is um, here on the left side you see um, the initial configuration of the digital micromirror um, array and this we just do randomly, we just load it on the DMD. And then what we do is we select a mirror, we flip the mirror, record the output on the analog power meter and this is actually after eight years of only doing copy paste from oscilloscope to MATLAB and then getting the, the result somewhere you know abstract in a number. Here it's really cool because you can you can actually follow the power meter doing the prediction. So it's uh, the first time I could really see a neural network predict in, in real time and in physical units. So what you see in blue is the target function what we want to approximate in this case it's one point pred um, ahead prediction and on the right side you see the error of the prediction. And then what we do is we invert the state of one mirror either from one to zero or from zero to one. We record the error, we compare it to the error we have recorded before. We say if it got better we keep this modification. If it got worse we revert back to the previous state and flip another node. There are some other details we, uh, we induce there to go away from random or by accident selecting two nodes consecutively at the same time or the same node twice in a row or we just introduced a bias in this, in this learning routine which pushes you away from updating a node you've just previously updated but um, in principle this is all we had to do. And then what you see here then is the, the learning where you see the red signal is our current output and it starts diverging from the first output state which you see here in grey and slowly starts to approximate the, the, the target signal which is the blue. And here on the right side you see how we rather let's say efficiently go down in error and approximate um, an error for this uh, Mackey glass time series prediction of 1% um, which is for this kind of prediction distance a factor of two more or less worse than the other previously reported results with delay systems but the big difference here is that um, 
the weights are really in hardware and the weights are Boolean. So I think considering this, it's a rather encouraging result. Um, but actually, there was a little bit of, of work we had to do before. We didn't end up at 1% error um, at the beginning. And this was not only optimizing hyperparameters. The other <coughs> hidden uh, question in this uh, system is something also already faced in the 80s. Is we have here uh, a system which is unipolar. Um, all co interferences are constructive. All intensities are positive. Um, coupling, the diffraction is uh, constructive, so basically there is no way um, or no point in our system where we can induce a negative number. So this really strongly limits the, the space of um, solutions we can provide by the system and we um, somehow try to, 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 to find a mitigation strategy for this. And uh, what we realized is that actually other than in the typical machine learning model, what we have here is a nonlinearity which is periodic. So in the end, if you say, I want to synthesize a certain class of nonlinear functions, the first thing you, what you need to start with is a um, system with a positive curvature and, an, and, and a negative curvature. So in our system, we can get this just by splitting the network for operating locally, starting from this point and then operating along this slope, and the other part of the network from starting operating at the local maxima and operating along the negative slope. And actually with this, um, so we achieved this by defining a random matrix for the bias offset for the individual nodes. And with this we found that we actually got quite a strong uh, performance improvement. So mu here is the ratio of nodes which operate in the um, um, local maximum versus the nodes operating from the local minimum. So at mu 0.25, 25% of your nodes start operating from the local maximum, so with a negative slope. And as we increase this fraction to 0.5, we see here how the performance actually improves by 50% compared to the uniformly distributed network actually by more. And then we have a clear error uh, minimum here at 45% in this case and on the other side because it's symmetric it basically it increases further, we've checked this. Um, another interesting bit what you see here is that since the initial um, um, setting of the readout weights is random, um, we get very different starting points for, uh, from the error. Sometimes you get 12%, sometimes you get 20%, sometimes only 6%. But where we end up with is always something rather um, systematic. And this for me, from a first, you know, let's say, hand-waving interpretation, means that we always more or less find the, the, the optimum performance and we could get not stuck in a, in a local minimum. Yes, yeah. how do you explain that the best performance is not at uh, 0 0.5, but... Uh, um, this is, uh, you can s see here, um, actually, if you do not consider these points of curvature, um, your future state is more or less um, um, correlated with your previous state. Um, and we tried this by training a linear system and when you basically want to do the correlation from your current, you do a linear predictor from your current point to the next one, um, you mostly get uh, positive components. Um, this is not really a proof. Uh, this is how I try to explain this myself. But with all of these things, I'm a little bit careful. I mean, in the end, it, it remains a black box, you know, to really find out these, these reasons and to say, it is this. Um, I'm, I'm most of the time reluctant to say it's, it's, it's really like this. This is how I try to explain it to myself. If, if it really is this, this reason behind it, uh, I think one has to be more careful. Um, so what we could do then is, um, since we've now trained our output to predict um, you can actually build a self-consistent system because if you have your future value, you can just use your own output and feed it back to, into yourself. And this is something Jaeger in the original manuscript actually did. And then the system becomes an autonomous predictor of uh, the, the time series you told it um, to, to approximate. And here we're still, let's say it starts working, but we're still far away. And the problem is that once we switch from driving by our example data to driving by our own input, we have a second transient. And there we get, a, at this moment, a very large divergence between um, our system's output and the one we try to predict. And afterwards, actually, they approximate again. 
So if you look uh, further away, the two time series, you know, only by visual comparison, they already look um, uh, alike to a certain fraction. We are missing the large amplitude excursions here. Um, the autocorrelations um, share certain similarities. And then if you go and translate this into attractor pictures here on the left side, you see the, the original Mackie glass attractor. And on the right side, you see the attractor which was created by our um, autonomous reservoir. And there's certainly, uh, you know, a long way to go. Um, the rotation does not yet fully fit, but that could be explained. But certainly you here already can see the input of noise. And um, that is basically what noise currently is doing to our system. You cannot really separate the different adjacent trajectories anymore. It just becomes one cloud. And this, I think, for me, is one of the big points what uh, we need to think about how we can reduce the impact of, of, of noise. Um, so for the la last five minutes, I'm not sure if I actually have the time for this. Um, I wanted to include something of our recent work, which we're just preparing to submit. And it is related to these attractive pictures. Um, yes, I have a quick question. Sure. So uh, one measure, obviously, of, of seeing how well you're predicting a nonlinear uh, non signal, a chaotic signal, <coughs> obviously looking at the attractor. Yeah. But another thing you can look at is the invariant measure of the phase space of yes. the chaotic dynamical system. Yes. And that maybe might be even a little more important because no. in a chaotic system, you're, you're interested, you know, almost in a quote unquote thermodynamic limit measuring some observables. Yeah. And to measure the observables, the, the, the invariant measure is, 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 is probably more important than, than the, the attractor. Yes. structure itself. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this was only for me an, an, an illustration to see, okay, we get an attractor which is not just, you know, a limit cycle. We really already get some topological features of the original attractor, but um, for sure for, you know, a quantitative analysis, this, I agree, it's not the best way. Yeah, because I mean, the, the attractor might not look exactly, but maybe maybe on average you get you get the invariant measure and that's that, that, that might even be more helpful. Yes, potentially. But I mean, it's here, what, what is clearly visible is that you, you have quite big problems of noise when you let the system basically evolve autonomously. And I don't know, for sure. I mean, I didn't even go further with this to do quantitative analysis. It's just a, a nice illustration for me. Um, so now completely switching gear. And um, what we asked ourselves is how how is it that actually these neural networks can predict? Because uh, many times, or most of the times, all you see is something called um, the memory capacity. You know, people say you have an echo in your system, you, you can reconstruct um, previous inputs, and then you can make a sum of those and you get a memory capacity. Um, but in the end, for me, in the end, memory capacity is not really task specific. You do not really know what to do with this number. How much memory capacity do you need to predict, um, you know, the Mackie glass time series or whatever other signal? For me, there is no direct link between this measure and actually what is needed from the system. And okay, it explains that it can reconstruct a certain number of previous inputs, but it's it's for me it's too far away from really trying to understand what's going on. Um, and um, where we ended up with is um, we looked back into what people did much before, before neural networks were really used for prediction. And there what they used is um, something like um, um, nearest neighbor techniques. And what nearest neighbor techniques are doing is basically they create a set of data on your, your attractor space. So what you need for this is first you need that your system is able to reconstruct the attractor it is trying to predict because in the end um, what point or the, the, the evolution of your system is determined by the flow field on your attractor. So if the neural network has no representation internally of the attractor it's trying to predict it will just not have this information or this was our starting point. So basically what we, are, we, 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 we try to, to, to go to is to see at each moment um, in time does the neural net or do the neural network states actually allow a reconstruction of the, day, uh, of the attractor along all its dimensions and does it then create a sampling. So for those who are not familiar with uh, nonlinear delay or nonlinear systems, what you can do is something for attractor reconstruction is Tarkin's embedding. So let's say you have one dimensional time series, chaotic, and you want to reconstruct the attractor. Then uh, what you do is you, for example, do an autocorrelation analysis, or you can also use mutual information between delay shifted signals. 
and you look for this for the minimum in autocorrelation or in mutual information between the signal and its delay shifted version and you can say at the temporal position of that minimum you have uh, the smallest amount of linearly similar or linear information content between my current state and the state shifted by that amount of time. So you can treat this as an approximately orthogonal dimension of your attractor space. So this is a rather, you know, old and well-established technique, but this is how people reconstruct attractors from a one-dimensional chaotic signal. And then where we went to is, okay, if we want to uh, find out if our neural network is actually capable of doing this, we should do something similar. So what we did is we did the cross-correlation between every node state and the input signal. Then we looked for the maximum in cross-correlation and its temporal lag. So if you would say for the Mackie glass time sequence, you look at the autocorrelation function, it has a minimum at minus 12. That means if, or it's, it's zero at minus 12 or approximately zero. That means if we find a node in our network which has a maximum cross-correlation between my input and, the, uh, and its own value, and the cross-correlation is 1 at exactly minus 12, that was, this would exactly correspond to the second embedding dimension of Tarkins. And here you see basically these positions in time and in, in cross-correlation amplitude of every node. So here every red data point is, one of, is the maximum and the lack of the cross-correlation between the node and its input. And here you see multiple dimensions of the Mackie glass attractor embedded with different time shifts. So this is minus 6, minus 12, minus 80, minus 24. And here you see the nodes with the highest correlations at these time lags. And you can actually see that already geometrically they are rather comparable. Not identical, but they're rather comparable. So this for us was the first indication that actually inside of the network state um, you can actually find the embedding of your attractor at every time. Um, then I have to speed up a bit. What you need to do if you want to increase the performance of your prediction is actually you need to improve your sampling. If you do not improve your sampling, you have no additional information and then why should your prediction be better than just using the original data set? So here you see the black lines, the black dots are basically samples from the original time sequence and the continuous line would be the continuous solution. Now this is our current trajectory, this is our current data point, and we want to predict this data point which will somewhere lie around here. So if you want to increase the information content you have for prediction, what you want to is you want to increase the number of samples you have in this neighborhood around this point. The sampling should be dense because you want to have a smooth uh, measuring of the surrounding and it should be roughly having this extent that it covers this neighborhood until the, uh, the future, future value, the rough position of your future value. And with this we use random projection theory, which basically says if you do um, random projections, um, then the projected object is typically preserved in its shape and this introduces some limits here and I do not have the time to go in them but basically it says you do not disrupt the distances. So what is a small distance before remains more or less a small distance, what is a large distance before remains largely a large distance and you do not have discontinuities in the embedded object. Um, and from this we basically created these three criteria we say, okay, at epsilon 2, uh, epsilon 2 is basically the extent of your sampling cloud. How big is the sampling cloud? If epsilon 2 is smaller than 1, the sampling cloud is very small. And if epsilon 1 is close to 1, sampling is very dense. So that means in this case, we have a very dense sampling just around the current data point. So that means you do not really get a lot of information of the trajectory until the point you're trying to predict. So the result is that prediction performance actually is not that good. Then at some point, epsilon 2 starts to cross uh, value 1, and at this position, the maximum size of the sampling cloud actually spreads from now until the future data point. So it means now we have dense sampling, but also in the attractor geometry, we can cover more or less the most likely position of the future point. And this is exactly the region where the system suddenly is capable to predict and our prediction error goes down by, by four orders of magnitude. As soon as you start to get autonomous dynamics, actually what is uh, failing is now the density of your sampling. Because let's say you start at uh, you know, 
periodic orbits, your periodic orbits already have amplitude um, oscillations of one, so it means you just push your samples at least one away from your, um, from your current data point, and we have shown this in another paper before. And this is basically why prediction then starts failing again. Um, to further confirm this, what we did is actually we took this cross-correlation cloud and we applied windowing filters. So that means the system um, evolving was still exactly the same, but the nodes available to the readout were only nodes which were contained in temporal windows. So here the window size is basically plus minus three, and then they are spaced by a certain distance. And what you can see here is that at distances which are half or integer of exactly the Tarkin's delay, the performance um, of the system improves a lot. And what you see here, red is the average standard reservoir computing performance. Here, if we have a window distance of minus six, minus seven, which is roughly half of the embedding time of Tarkin's, we actually get an order of magnitude improvement with less nodes than the original reservoir. So this already was a very strong indication for me that this really is um, the crucial feature in a reservoir if you want to predict, you need these embedding dimensions. But what we did then to further confirm this and to make a prove a nice point is what we did is we actually pushed the system into bad operating conditions. We chose a bifurcation parameter of 0.2. What happens is all your nodes are, so are concentrated only at two temporal shift positions. It means from the, the four Tarkins embedding dimensions for Mackey glass, you only cover two. So you lack information about the other two and the system diverges, cannot predict. What we did then is we introduced another delay of just the reservoir state and shifted it by exactly the Tarkin's delay and by this we basically created a copy of this one at the second dimension of this one at the fourth dimension. So now we have sampling of all four dimensions at the same time and directly the consequence is that the system can perfectly predict as if it would be operated as a bifurcation parameter of one. Um, and we use this to stabilize a stochastically driven excitable system and the reservoir, the original one in gray, is basically never able to, to stabilize the system. Uh, doesn't matter for how many hundreds of nodes, it's, it's, it's basically never remains um, 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 at the stable performance. And with this Tarkin's delay term included, we just need 12 nodes and the reservoir directly is able to stabilize the system. And I think I should finish because I'm at one hour <laughs> and it's only here a commercial slide. Um, I'm organizing with some um, other people a conference um, in Hanover uh, together with um, Herbert Jaeger, uh, Stuart Parkin and Gordon Pieper and the submission deadline is already over but whoever is interested in this field we um, have a really broad um, field of participants so from neuroscience, from mathematics, from computational neuroscience, from machine learning, uh, physicists, engineers. So if people are interested, um, please have a look um, at the website here. And um, registration for, for participation is still open. Um, there are still some 50 um, slots um, um, available. As I said, submission deadline is already closed, but the abstracts have been uploaded, so you can already get an idea of what, uh, what will be presented at this conference. Thank you very much.